So I hope you all had a, a refill of coffee or tea. Um, the next panel is a, a subject close to my heart. I think it's very timely, very interesting. Uh, lots of policies happening in, in this area. Um, and it's called Promoting Open Access to Data and Evidence. Um, let me introduce the chair of the panel, which is our very own Beryl Leach. She is the director, 3IE director and the head of the policy and advocacy team and member of 3IE's senior management team. Uh, she leads and provides strategic direction to 3IE's work in promoting greater access to and use of evidence. Um, 3IE's global advocacy as well and country and regional work in Africa. She is currently working on validating and documenting how 3IE measures evidence use, providing effective capacity development to use evidence in decision making, and continuing to strengthen 3IE's institutional policies and processes. She's also helping to develop the means to integrate visible gender responsiveness and equity focus in all aspects of 3IE's work. So, over to Beryl. I would like to begin uh, by introducing the, uh, my colleagues and, and speakers, and uh, then I'll explain a little bit about how the session is going to run, and then give you a bit of context. And then my job will be done, hopefully, other than a little prodding and, and uh, sorting out people who want to talk at the same time. Uh, so without further ado, now I sat in the back at the beginning of this session, so I'm going to ask you, Put your hand up, all right, if you want to. Otherwise, I am going down the line in case you can't see everybody. Um, and my first um, colleague to introduce is Arnold Wagenet. Arno is the research director at the National Center for Social Research here in uh, the UK and founder and director of MetaLab, a consultancy that develops, implements, and evaluates new tools to make research and teaching more cost effective. He is also a visiting lecturer at the London School of Economics and Sciences Po. Arnaud is interested in defining uh, what makes good research decisions. He also studies the economic, political, psychological, and philosophical factors driving these decisions. Next to him, I'm pleased to introduce uh, a, a fellow 3IE uh, staff member, Nita Gol, who manages 3IE's portfolio of WASH impact evaluation grants. She's also actively engaged in 3IE's research transparency initiatives, such as contributing to the development of 3IE's research transparency policy, managing 3IE's impact evaluation registry, known lovingly as RIDI, and providing oversight to the verification of 3IE's impact evaluation data. Over the past two decades, Nita has been engaged in the design, implementation, and evaluation of interventions focusing on disadvantaged populations. Her interest in evidence-based policies and programs is grounded in these field experiences. Prior to 3IE, Nita worked on several national, sorry, worked with several national and international NGOs. She holds a PhD in childhood studies from Rutgers University. Next to her, my friend and colleague, Adeline Sabanda, who is the president of the African Evaluation Association, also known lovingly as AFREA, as well as president of the International Organization of, um, for Cooperation and Evaluation. She is the founder and managing director of, um, is it AIDSIM? Addison Developments, formerly Tro Park Consultancy Services. Adeline has 26, 26 years experience in the development field with a focus on planning, monitoring, and evaluation with a specific interest on gender responsive evaluations. She has worked in over 20 sub-Saharan African countries with clients such as the World Bank, African Development Bank, USAID, and others. And at the end, I am very pleased to welcome Kristen Comives, who is the Director of Impacts for ICL uh, Alliance. She leads ICL's work on the impacts of sustainability standards. And before joining ICL, Kristen worked as a senior lecturer in environment and in sustainable development at the International Institute for Social Studies uh, in uh, the Netherlands. At ISS, she taught master's and PhD courses on research methodology, sustainable development, and environmental policy. Kristen has also worked as a research consultant for international organizations such as the World Bank. So a very uh, august panel. 
Um, and I know that it's a panel full of pa people who are passionate uh, about working on increasing uh, access to data and, and evidence. This session is what we call a talk show style. So speakers are going to give a brief overview of what they consider the most important issues or challenges or what they're doing and describing uh, key projects that are going to help frame the discussion. There'll be interactions among the speakers. I'll ask questions, but also it's very important to bring the audience in because there are those of you who are also working on uh, open access and transparency in your own work, have questions, have contributions about what it is that uh, you are doing that could help uh, broaden the information that we're able to share together, okay? So you're just gonna have to trust me to know kind of when to pitch it out to you and when to bring it back and I'll do the best that I uh, possibly can. Now, why are we having this panel? Why now? Because essentially we know that open access and transparency is getting better. Accessibility is increasing. We hear about major initiatives, DFID, uh, two to three years ago now, capped off a long dialogue about the importance of open access with a major policy. There have been ongoing discussions with academic journal publishers about how to make more of the gated publications available to people free of charge. We've seen an explosion of open access journals uh, in uh, covering develop important development uh, sector themes. And recently, when, and this we will cover here in the panel today, we've, we've seen the EU be helpful and unhelpful kind of at the same time in that they've put forward an initiative that now 15 major donors have signed up to, which would say that any uh, development funded research will be publicly available from the time of publication, uh, no restrictions from 2020 and with an outside goal of 2022. But at the same time, and that's great, but at the same time the EU has brought us um, the GDPR, um, which Arno is responsible for, for taking us through, they kind of, they give with one hand and are taking with the other by, by tightening privacy rules around data that are great when it comes to Facebook and Google and some of these uh, issues, but not so good if you're a researcher. Okay, and how to mediate and find that balance. We're also going to hear about uh, another aspect where uh, access and, and transparency come to the fore. ICEAL is uh, doing work similar to what you've been hearing about at the conference that 3IE has been doing, where we're engaged in producing and making available public goods. So access and availability as a public good through databases, through portals. Um, Howard White mentioned this in his fourth wave of evidence yesterday morning where he put up the slide about the portal that you can go to that digests evidence and makes it more readily, readily available to decision makers uh, in education in the UK. So all of these efforts are coming together, but we have uh, speakers who are going to help us see what is the political economy of this. Is everybody getting access? Who's getting it? Why? Who's not? Why? And that's a very important part. If we can wrap all of our discussion around this idea of the political economy of accessibility um, as development specialists, that is something that uh, remains central to our values and how we think about things. So I'm going to start. Arno, go ahead and kick us off, please, with about five minutes. And uh, then we'll just move down the line and see where we go. Um, so I'd like to start my introduction by thanking 3IE for um, having me here. Um, and I am, like Beryl said, I'm very passionate about research transparency and reproducibility. And so whenever I have the opportunity to talk about this, I always like jump and make myself available. So uh, thank you to uh, 3IE for their leadership and uh, their policy to increase uh, research transparency and reproducibility. Um, I think it's important to tell the audience that um, I have a sort of double hat. So I'm not only a social researcher like many of you, I'm also a meta researcher. So I'm also interested in how researchers make research decisions and how is it that sometimes they make research decisions that are quite good and sometimes not so good. Uh, and we can 
discuss what it means to make good research decisions. Um, so I'll bring in that perspective very much. Uh, so sometimes I'll talk as a social researcher, and sometimes I'll talk about meta research and my experience in observing you lot and and what I think about it. Um, also, I think one one thing important to bear in mind is that I do most of my research in the UK and Europe. And um, I will mention how important the institutional context is uh, when it comes to making your research uh, transparent and reproducible. So this is also something to bear in mind. So I'm talking from a European perspective and what are our constraints as European when we do social research. Um, so one of the questions we were asked is, um, so what are the challenges in making uh, research more transparent and reproducible? I think the first challenge is to know what we talk about. So this is where I take my meta research at heart and, 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 and propose a sort of a definition that hopefully everyone will agree with. Because every time I talk about research transparency and reproducibility, on the surface, it seems that a lot of people agree and seem to know what it means. But the deeper you go into the conversation and, and the more you realize that actually we're talking about different things. And in, in my opinion, transparency, reproducibility, replicability, openness, these are very closely related terms, but they're not interchangeable. They mean different things. And I'm not going to bore you with the definition. I can do that later if you want. I think these are different dimensions of the same concept. But I think what links or connects all these different terms together is another concept that I would like to bring to the panel, which is the concept of reusability. So in my opinion, and I, I would I don't know if, if my fellow panelists will, will agree, is that ultimately uh, the purpose of transparency, reproducibility, replicability, and all these terms is to make research and research components, the, the components that make a study, to make them easily reusable by third parties. And this has two implications. The first implication is, is that when you think in terms of reusability, it brings two perspectives. You, first, you have to define who are your reusers. So when you do a study, and if you produce data, if you produce codes, etc., who would you like to reuse uh, these tools and these components? So you stop thinking about your perspective, but you have to put yourself in the sort of customer's uh, shoes and think about, how this person will reuse what I'm producing and what do they know about my research. And the second implication is that um, uh, so reusability is um, it's not a binary concept, it's, um, it's a qualitative judgment. Your research and the research components will be more or less reusable and so they will be on a scale from easily reusable to hardly um, uh, uh, reusable. Um, the second clarification that I want to bring is uh, to, to the audience is, um, and the second challenge that I face when I talk about uh, transparency and reproducibility is that for a lot of people, research, they, they talk about research as a single entity and as something that is quite monolithic. Whereas I think that research is made of three different components, which are the data that you use, which can be qualitative or quantitative. There are also procedures, that's the second component. So that can be the codes that you use if you do quantitative research to analyze a certain research question. But if you do qualitative research, it can be the theoretical framework that you use to analyze your interview um, information, etc., or your survey data. And the third component is uh, the results that you find. And so there are three components. And uh, your, your research can be one component of your research can be reusable, but that doesn't mean that the two other components can be reusable. So for example, and this reflects my, my experience as a social researcher and, and, uh, and someone working for the National Center for Social Research, I think that our uh, findings are uh, easily, our results are easily reusable, but the data we use, and I can explain later why, um, uh, is not so easily reusable. So our research is reusable on some, for some components, but not reusable from, for other components. So these dimensions do not necessarily go hand in hand. And finally, I, I would suggest that if you're interested in making your research more reusable, more transparent, more reproducible, I would suggest that first, and I can explain that later, I would suggest that first you start by making your results more reusable, because that's easier, I'll explain that later. Then 
the procedures, you focus on the procedures, and then I think what's the most difficult to make uh, uh, reusable, the, the, the most difficult component is data for regulatory uh, and institutional reasons, and this is also something that I will develop uh, later on. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for uh, joining us uh, in this uh, session and this panel discussion here today. Um, I work for 3A, as uh, Beryl mentioned, and you know we turned 10 this year, uh, those of you who joined us yesterday and those of you who are here today. And right from its inception, 3A has been extremely committed to the whole um, paradigm of research transparency. So from 10 years ago, when this wasn't such a common conversation to be happening, the leadership at the time, uh, in their wisdom, decided that this was something the organization was going to be committed to from day one. And it's one of the reasons uh, that I'm very proud to be working for an organization that's so focused on transparency right from the day it started. Uh, that said, over the past 10 years, we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we work in developing country contexts. We see research transparency and providing open access to data and publications. Uh, as an ethical and moral imperative, because many times the context that we work in, there isn't data available. And so we use, you know, when you use public funds to uh, do these, conduct these evaluations in developing country contexts, it really is an ethical responsibility to make sure that data is reusable, as Arno pointed out, and that it has, it can be used by researchers and policymakers and anybody else across the world uh, for multiple purposes. In some ways, we, it's also an ethical responsibility to the people we are collecting data from so that we don't keep going back and recollecting that same data, uh, in some ways misusing limited resources that are available as well as the time of the people that we are uh, uh, working for and working on behalf of. So these are the things, these are some of the reasons why 3A is committed to open data and uh, open access. But what have we learned over the past 10 years? One of the things that we found out is that uh, it's not enough to have a commitment, it's also important to enforce it and to make sure that researchers that we work with, projects that we fund, that everyone's on board with this. And one of the, the ways we did that in our 10th year is to articulate our commitment in a research transparency policy. And this was a policy we put together with a lot of thought into what is it that we wanted to accomplish, what is it that institutions across the world are doing, and how do we negotiate and set the bar higher in terms of research transparency. Uh, so our research transparency policy, which is on our website in case uh, you'd like to take a look, um, it emphasized things that have worked well for us in the past. It also set the bar a little higher than we have in the past. So for instance, we mandated pre-registration of studies in RIDI. We thought that was important so that researchers across the world would know that there is, uh, there are evaluations being conducted on a particular topic within a particular geographical context uh, and with a particular you know, uh, group or population. And so that's one of the new things that we mandated. Uh, research teams have always been free to do this uh, you know, of their own volition, but now we've mandated it that any grants that we fund, they must uh, pre-register. As I mentioned, open access uh, to d both data and uh, the, our publications uh, was a part of 3IE's beginnings. But one of the things we also learned over the past few years uh, is that our responsibility and accountability is greater given the replication crisis that is um, that we've all probably heard about globally and across disciplines. For instance, Gertler and his colleagues earlier this year published an article in uh, Nature on, they looked at journals across multiple disciplines like political science and economics and psychology. All of these journals had one thing in common, they mandated the submission of data and code when the article was being uh, submitted to a particular journal. So this was a condition of publication. And what Gertler and colleagues did was to collect all those data sets. There were about over 200 of them uh, and they tried to replicate the analysis that, or reproduce the analysis using the data and code to see whether it matched the journal article that was published. And they found, to their surprise, that they could only replicate one in seven studies. So even when data is open access, uh, there are no guarantees that 
uh, the data are reliable or valid, or there may be concerns with the data. And this is just one example. I think over the past few years, uh, there's been a lot of debate about the, uh, you know, whether uh, about the replication crisis and how we should try to fix it across disciplines. And so at 3AE, one of the things that we've done is realize that it's not enough to post the data on Harvard Dataverse, which is uh, what we do when evaluations close. We began doing internal push button replications for every single one of them. So before we post the data in the public domain, we actually take the time to use the data and code supplied by the research team and to check that uh, the results match what are in there, uh, you know, what is reported in the final evaluation reports before we post it. And in the process, we found out about other things as well. For instance, institutional review boards uh, ban the sharing of identified uh, data, but we were finding evaluation teams are actually submitting identified data to us uh, in violations of those codes. And so we had to take a long and hard and close look at uh, what is the data that we are getting, what is our accountability, and how do we make sure that the data are re reusable, but also shared in a way that is most useful, and shared in a timely way, because usually we get requests from evaluation teams who want us to hold off on sharing the data for four years or five years, or however long it takes to publish uh, their results in a peer-reviewed journal. So that has been one of our challenges. Uh, another challenge is our focus, uh, 3A is very focused on mixed methods. And uh, it's easier to anonymize or de-identify data uh, when it's quantitative. It's much more of a challenge to do it with qualitative data. So we haven't really, uh, our focus this year has been on quantitative data, but one of the challenges that we are hoping to um, you know, work on shortly is qualitative data, and that's going to be another uh, element to what uh, we are doing. So it's a continuation of our commitment, but uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear if you all have had similar experiences or ideas to share in terms of qualitative and quantitative data. I think I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. So um, I'm going to speak based on my experience um, in Africa and the, what we see um, our members experiencing as well as myself as uh, an evaluator. So I'm, I'm talking about open access to data and evidence. And so when we look at the issue of just access, for us, that's where we're just at. The issue of just access, never mind the definitions or whatever, access to data, access to evidence. We talk about the issue of cost. You know, if you have to pay for the data, uh, you know, to access the data, to access the journals, it's it's just prohibitive. The mechanisms that are used to pay online are, are something else. Uh, if you have a card that is accepted, you're lucky. Uh, and sometimes you don't even have the resources or the credit card to use to pay for the data. And one thing that I realized that you don't know what you, do, you don't have until you experience it somewhere else. So when you travel and you, you're part of an institution and I mean, you've got all this data available, all these journals that are available to you, you say, wow, just at the click of the button, I, I can get this. But it's such a mission when you're working from Africa. And it's not just the cost, but the bandwidth, internet, access. So when you're trying to, okay, let's say I've got the access, I've got the money, I mean, I've paid for it. And now I'm trying to download and use the data and manipulate the data or access the journal articles. And it's something else you wait a long time to download. And so I was so excited when I heard about this, um, you know, this session that was going on on democratizing access to evidence and how it can be packaged in a way at least that I can find sort of a repository of data in one place where I don't have to look there and look somewhere else. So, so you know, as evaluators coming from Africa, we find ourselves having maybe to use, you know, hard copies of copies of, you know, so I'm saying it's been copied so many times. And so by the time you get it, it you, you can hardly read it. I mean, when I was a student uh, at, at the university in Zimbabwe, 
it was really mainly hard copies of whatever journal you're getting or whatever. Yeah, so, so we say, oh, why don't you just go and use uh, secondary data? You don't have to go and collect primary data. It's when you have access to that data. So that, those are, I mean, those are the basic challenges we are having. So, so our challenges are, are really around access, the cost and the, you know, um, bandwidth and, and just getting access to the data. So that's our, pri uh, our major um, problem. And the fact that the, the data is sort of, um, I don't know, uh, should I say um, limited in terms of your access, even though it may have been collected from yourselves as in Africa or somewhere else, is also a key problem. So there's not that much transparency. So even if I was involved in collecting data and I was part of the process, once I hand it over as an evaluator, I have no right to use that data. And you, when you sign contracts, that's one of the things that we, are, we sign to, that you, you surrender everything that you've used in this project. So when I'm doing a similar thing, I can't quite go there without requesting for permission. And in some cases, you're not given that permission. So what have we done? What are we doing as the African Evaluation uh, Association? One of the things we, we're trying to address that, the evidence side, uh, by publishing our own journal, which is an open access journal, the African Evaluation Journal. And um, it has, you know, um, really been working, but it is funded, fully funded, you know, by... Uh, f you know, funders, and it's not always easy to get funders to fund the issues that you want to write about, to publish about. Uh, and so sometimes, you, you know, we have a general edition and we also have uh, a special edition. So getting funding for this general edition where you fund whatever, you know, uh, uh, evaluations you want or uh, research you want becomes a problem. And so that, those are some of the issues we're grappling with. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to join this conversation. It's already very interesting, so I feel like I'm participating as well. Maybe to make my comments make sense, I'll explain a little bit more about what ICL Alliance is and where I'm coming from. So we're a nonprofit organization, we're a membership association, and our members are sustainability standards like Fair Trade, Forest Stewardship Council, Marine Stewardship Council. These are all market-based mechanisms for trying to deliver sustainability outcomes on the ground or in, in the sea. So we're a, a category of intervention, you could think about it that way. Uh, one of the things that ICL Alliance does with all of our members is to try to help them be much better about doing research about their interventions. And you mentioned 3IE is 10 years old. ICEAL has something that we call our impacts code, which is also 10 years old. The impacts code is what our members sign up to, and it requires them to have monitoring and evaluation systems and to subject themselves to also independent evaluation. Um, and importantly, for the purpose of this conversation, also to put the results out there. So one of the ways in which we are trying to promote um, transparency and access is by working with these organizations that run schemes and interventions and requiring them or encouraging them um, through this requirement to actually put their data out there. A challenge, though, in our field, because we're talking about market-based mechanisms, is that a lot of the interesting research that's done is done and funded by companies. And companies are much less forthcoming with the results of their evaluations. So we frequently are in situations where we're all sitting around a table, and it turns out you know, three companies and two standard systems have all done research in exactly the same area, and they don't know anything <laughs> about the other one. Um, and we're asking the same questions over and over and over again. So I, I would say there's some progress on that front. At least people are talking about letting each other know what's going on, but it is really slow and really painful. The other side of what we do as ICEAL is to try to make information 
accessible in a broad sense. So um, through all the work we've been doing over the last 10 years and the work of all of these sustainability standards, there is much more evidence out there now than 10 years ago. In fact, you could almost argue now that there is so much out there that people can't make sense of it anymore. So now the challenge is to say, okay, how do you take all that information and help people get access to it so that they can use it so an evaluator can say, here, we know all of this already, right? Um, so we have a new project we're working on now that's currently called the Global Impacts Platform. It'll have a new name, I think, by next week, but let's just call it Global Impacts Platform for the moment. And this platform that we're building will be a repository for all of the research about sustainability standards. That is our goal, one-stop shop, everyone looking for the information. But as you'll know, we can't host the actual articles in many cases because they're behind paywalls. So when they're not, we'll host them. When they are, we'll have abstracts or we'll have our own descriptions so people can find them. But I guess even more importantly than that, we are going we're using a systematic mapping processes and a systematic coding process to go into the articles and pull out very specific pieces of information that everyone is looking for. So in particular, did the intervention make a difference or not? Was there a statistically significant you know, positive or negative result? So we're coding all of the research like that. And then um, the platform will present in various visual ways the results. So here in this, we're trying to uh, deal with two things. So the one, the challenge of just finding the stuff, having it all in one place, as you, as you asked. We would like that too. Two, making uh, people who are not used to reading all of these articles, making them be able to make some sense of the results. Um, our audience for the platform is the decision makers, or I should say more specifically, the people who do the research for the decision makers. So this could be in government, it can be in business, it could be even the producers who are deciding whether they want to become fair trade certified, right? How do we help all of these um, organizations make sense of the evidence that is out there? And I think that's a really important part of accessibility and transparency that should be part of this conversation. I'm Mike, and this is new. Um, and I was so interested in whatever he was saying, I forgot to turn it back on. So, um, so this is a learning by doing moment. Um, I'm going to have two quick reactions, but I want everybody to be able to react to each other. All right? I want to bring in something from other conversations that uh, fits in very well here, and that is. We're all used to saying, oh, for-profit companies, bad corporations, of course they're going to keep hold of their, their data and all this, right? But in the work that I'm doing in, in Africa, what we're seeing at country level, uh, it was Adeline's uh, bit about the, the, the inequality of data uh, collection and evidence production. And 60% of evaluation evidence in Uganda is commissioned by donors who then do not share it. So if you are a uh, Ugandan government official, you cannot access that information. Okay. So if we're if we're going to be frustrated, let's broaden the 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 church a little bit. That uh, donors are very much so. Yes, we're saying great. You're signing up these open access uh, policies to make everybody sign up. But on the, so they're giving with one hand and they're still keeping with the other. And Adeline's story is one that in Africa, the role of evaluators is as usually a freelance consultant, brought on not even leading the team. And they're signing contracts that say, and the World Bank does it too, if you produce any intellectual property in the course of fulfilling this work, for you to use it for any other reason, you have to um, get permission. And even when the bank is willing to give you permission, the governments that were part of the, the research often will not uh, as a condition. So we are helping generate all, this, all these data, and then we're not able to do it. So Arno's point about reusability hits a, a, a big wall. So I just wanted to chime in with those two quick things, and, um, and then I turn it over to my colleagues to what, what, what resonated with you as you heard from from other people here. And audience, be prepared. 
I'm pitching it out to you after they get their chance, all right? So be thinking about your great comments and how you can contribute. Minimize your, your desire to just talk uh, with the mic on what you want to talk about, okay? All right. So uh, thank you very much. I actually have more questions, so um, because this triggers a lot of, of questions. So I don't I don't know I, w I don't want to start with answers. I'd like to actually start with with more questions to the audience and and to the other panelists. Um, so so all of you so uh, seem to be to different degrees and and in different countries seem to be promoting um, transparent research research that can be reused, um, but that begs. Uh, two questions. The first is, um, so you're basically offering a kind of additional service to your stakeholders. You can say, okay, we used to just produce results, but now we give you access to the data and we give you, and this has a cost, right, to the organization. So my question, so what I would really be interested to know is, um, so what, why do you do it? Who, and based on what evidence, so what do you know about the people who are supposed to reuse uh, these codes, questionnaires, whatever you make uh, available? Do you have any information about their needs? Um, and what are their obstacles in reusing this uh, data? Because it's not enough to, to, you know, to put it online, but... Uh, if the language that is used, or if the data is not presented in a way that makes sense to the reuser, they're, they're not going to be reusing it. And the second question is, uh, and that reflects uh, on, on my experience at Natsen and other organizations, is um, I'm fascinated when I am envious, or at least um, curious, when I hear that data sets are, seem to be available online and can be downloaded and, and reused. So in, in, um, I, I told you earlier that I do research in the area of education. So we use, uh, so one of the data sets we use is the National Pupil data, Database, which is a humongous uh, database of exam and test results for virtually all pupils in the UK. And as you can imagine, this data is uh, is really protected because it covers the virtually the whole population of pupils and students. It's also um, longitudinal, so we have many many years of data, and it's also it has width. So for for each single individual in in the database, we have thousands, of, no, yeah, thousands, but at least hundreds of variables, and so this data can easily identify the students. So how is it? So this is a challenge that we're facing. So um, at Natsen, we uh, are constrained by the uh, general um, uh, regulation on personal data protection, the GDPR. How is that a problem in outside of Europe or um, in India, in Africa? So these are two dimensions also, uh, questions I'd like to ask you. Okay. Are we going down the line? Yeah, if you have, if you have any comments that you want to make. Uh, this seems to be a common question that, that you have also posed. How are others dealing with de-identification requirements? We're being challenged at 3IE. Arno is throwing out that with education data, large data sets, um, that they're struggling too. So anybody who can pitch in with any insights on, on how to tackle that, we, we, I think that's what we're saying. We're welcoming that into the conversation in particular. And if, uh, go ahead, and if you don't, you can pass it along. It's an obligation. I think uh, I'll just say that what my uh, fellow panelists here shared in terms of, uh, you know, our theme today about democratizing uh, evidence, it just connected with me because it's not just about open access, which I think most people would say, yeah, that's a good thing. But also what you said about, um, about the sharing of that evidence and how it's shared. And in my mind, it connected to... Uh, what Gonzalo mentioned yesterday at uh, the Howard White lecture, um, you know, in the concluding part of the day, where he talked about storytelling and making sure, so presenting a number, a bunch of tables and figures doesn't always explain what the findings are, what, are, what is the relevance of that. And so I think uh, 
our role goes beyond just ensuring, oh, here's the open data, now you make of it what you want. Or here's open access to this evaluation finding of 150 pages that probably doesn't make sense to people who are not used to reading that kind of literature. But going even a step further and saying, what's the story behind this? Uh, and uh, what does that mean to somebody, to the common person? How does that affect them? Or even to policymakers who may not be able to make sense of the academic language or the research language that we're using. So yeah, I think it's setting the bar even higher in terms of as researchers, as evaluators, as people who fund evaluations and, and research and do it ourselves. How do we then uh, translate the message? How do we tell the story behind it? And I think that's another interesting angle to think about here. Yeah. So I, I, if I can just sum up, it's the idea of being, it, what is important that Arno is saying and you're amplifying is that who is your audience? So if we just are sitting here as researchers going, yeah, give me the data sets. That's exactly what I need. I know how to de-identify. I'm happy. And you know, internet access and, and cost and all that uh, aside. But then, as Kristen is pointing out, if you want decision makers to use it, it's a whole nother approach with its own barriers and, and challenges. Adeline? Um, I just wanted to say uh, what Nita and um, what Christine, um, you know, we're talking about, sort of resonate with, um, you know, what Afria has been sort of trying to, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, get to in terms of having data that is accessible but relevant. Uh, as I said yesterday, we had a meeting with policymakers where they say, you know, what very often the data that's available is not in a format that is ready for us to use, and they're not gonna go and start you know, looking at the data and putting it in the right format. So I think um, we have to have different audiences. I'm sure uh, the different organizations who have different audiences that will use that data. And I think the important thing is, is the data uh, usable, uh, is the, uh, you know, whatever, you know, evaluation reports, the, um, results that you're publishing, are they, can they be used by policymakers for decision making? And I think in the end, as I said yesterday, it's not just about just accessing data for the sake of it, or accessing uh, you know, uh, evaluative evidence for the sake of it. It has to make a difference in people's lives. And I think we're not generating all this information just for the fun of it. Uh, we must have the and use uh, in our minds as we discuss this, because I think that is what is key and important, and that is what impacts people's lives, what we do with the information we, we get. So just responding to your first comment about money and do we know what people want. So uh, first on the money question, um, the work that we do is funded by donors. So this global impact platform I mentioned is funded by um, GEF, and it's funded for four years, and so we we haven't even launched the platform for the world to see yet, and we're already talking about partnerships, business models, and you know what else do we need to do in order to make it survive after those four years? Because otherwise, it's a big investment and a huge loss, I think, in terms of public goods. But it is not easy because it, particularly what you mentioned, funding the basic stuff, it's easy enough to find people who want to do the systematic mapping of evidence on X topic, or the company who wants to say, I wanna know everything about Uganda or something. That's pretty easy to find actually. But what's hard is to find someone who wants to cover the costs of the ongoing maintenance of this kind of public good. And I think that's a real challenge. So, uh, the other thing on knowing who is going to use the information, I think, is uh, absolutely critical. We, in our case, um, we have very clear end users because of the type of intervention that we are. And so, one of the things we do on a regular basis is actually ask people what they want and need. I think the interesting point for us there, um, from what we've learned, is people say they want impacts information but very often what they want is something much 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 simpler than that they want to just know what is a sustainability standard or how does it work or does it address gender or um, do we see that producers actually improve practices you know forget the 
RCT kind of thing. So, which isn't, so we do both, I guess, but we recognize that if we go whole hog in the super complicated evaluation route, we're actually not going to meet the needs of everyone. And it is important then to realize that there are differences um, and, and try to make that range of information available. Great, all, all excellent points. So uh, raise your hand if you have a question or comment. When you get the mic, please stand and introduce yourself. And let me know if you are just commenting because my timekeeping will be a bit different. Um, and, uh, and or if you're going to have, try to have a question at the end. So in the interest of time, it would be great if you could limit yourselves to about a minute to two minutes. We'll take up to three pan, uh, speakers. Please jot down notes because you'll all get a chance to address any one of them uh, that you want. Okay? All right. Go. Hi. Uh, Rod Dubitsky, independent consultant, but worked 10 years for a, uh, a global NGO. I come from this as an outsider perspective. Most of my career is spent on Wall Street. Um, where data standardization was, was a mantra. So I have a question, is there a global data dictionary and standard across all different invention, uh, intervention types? So in, in my NGO, the NGO I worked for, I worked on programs in health and education and agriculture, uh, adolescent clubs, gender empowerment, and every time we came to a proposal, there were all sorts of variations in terms of the data metrics required to be reported. Also, I have grave concerns about measurement, exclusive breastfeeding. Is it accurate? Is it self-reported? Hand washing, is it self-reported? Can we have trust in it? And I started to doubt so many of the data metrics, both how it's defined, how we're collecting it, what we're supposed to be collecting, what we're actually collecting, and if there's a best practice data dictionary for each intervention. Another example, agriculture. Improvement in yield by 50%. Well, how is yield measured? Is it reported by the farmers? Or are we going out and directly measuring it? Is it sampling? So all of these questions around data, dictionary, and definition, is it, is it something that the industry has tackled so that when you do post the data, we can compare data to UNICEF, to right. BRAC, and so great, forth? That's great, my question. Great, great question. And I, I see three IE people just jumping <laughs> up and down in their seats. When, why didn't I get on this panel? Because I have something to say. We'll try to work it in. Okay. Hand here, there's gonna be one, let's try to be fair, there's one way, way in the back too, and then back up here. We're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna burn a lot of calories on this one, ha only having one mic. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Josephine, I'm with Rapid at ODI. So my question, like this whole um, issue about open access and about who are we really talking about, I'm on a project with Tanzanian researchers where they have, they have no internet in their entire office. And like all, <coughs> like students and academics, they have to like tether from their phone in order to get internet access. So like my question to everyone is like I'm like there's parallel conversations with the data for development co like community and like what I really want to talk about is instead of mechanisms about how do we get everyone access to internet what I really want to talk about is the politics around evidence because like I'm I'm really tired of saying like how do we work more with Tanzanian researchers when like actually they have real fundamental issues here. Thanks. Thanks Josephine. There was one there, and then one there, and then we'll come back to the panel. It, against the wall, against the wall, that hand goes to the next round. Hi. Um, is it, can you hear me? No, could you stand up so we could all see you? That'll help. I thought I was pretty tall, but never mind. I'll there we go. Up. No, no, <laughs> thank I'm you. I'm not sure actually if the issue I'm going to ask has already been discussed. I mean, my mind sometimes wanders around, so... I'm not quite sure, but I'm going to ask you anyway. It's particularly for um, Adeline and Nila. So it's, um, the question is about the impact of language, not, not just the technical jargon around evaluation, but the language itself that you know, the information is produced. Um, usually it's uh, produced in European languages, in, for example, English, maybe French. So how does that hinder the access of you know, information, particularly in the African context and, and Asian context. Um, my second question is actually to you, it's, it's quick. Okay, I'm just introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, my name is Zeno. Um I'm from Somalia, the Ministry of Planning. Okay, thank you. And um, my question is to you, uh, Berli. I mean, earlier you mentioned that most um, evaluations are 
commissioned by donors, and you spoke about the case of Uganda and how they don't share um, you know, the data. So what's the justification? How, how do they justify that? I mean, can you elaborate that a little bit? Thank you. Okay. Okay, back to, back to you all. <coughs> I can jump in on a question oh, of... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got, I got so carried away by the <laughs> idea that I was going to have to answer a question that I lost track of my real job. Okay. Hello. My name is Akram. I'm working uh, with local NGO in Yemen, but as well we do uh, development analysis, analysis, and I'm a development analyst as well. So I can see there is a bit of gap, or okay, there is a gap between the global north and the global south when it comes to sharing data, and as well the transparency. How can we push more? local researchers into the platform of the Global North and, and, and promote more of their work in the, plat in the platform of the Global North. So I just wanted to first uh, respond to the question on data standardization. The answer is no, unfortunately. <laughs> and I would say even within our community of one set of interventions, we work on data standardization and it is very hard. I'll say, in, because we're talking about transparency, I'll say that a, a workaround, which is not perfect, but what we're trying to do is be very explicit when presenting results about what the metric was that was actually measured um, and warning people about when you can put information together or not. Uh, so that's not perfect, but at least it's making people aware of the fact that you actually you had slightly different measures and it probably doesn't make sense to compare them to each other. Okay. Internet access. Um, I'm going to talk about the, you know, I, 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 I totally agree with um, the lady who spoke about access to data and the issues you mentioned about Tanzania. I mean, those are the issues that I was referring to. And the point is um, access to data is political. It is also a, a power issue. And I mean, what I said yesterday still applies to what we are talking about, about access to data and, you know, the use of data. And so how do we depoliticize it so that everybody who needs to have access has access? I think it's something that we, I, I throw back to the audience and we say, how can we do that? Be, uh, because it's something that we constantly fighting. And then around, um, the issue uh, about language, uh, we find that most of the data, I mean, really, most of the, I think, that I find around evaluation is actually in English. And even French is also limited. And so it is, I mean, it's another, uh, you know, challenge that needs to be addressed. Uh, there won't be much in Arabic and, and other languages. And I think one of the things that people are trying to do is to make their, to have um, auto translation on their websites, and that helps. But I also understand that the transla translations are not as uh, accurate, uh, and and that is a a, a problem that uh, I think still needs uh, to be addressed. And we don't have a solution to that. Uh, we just uh, as a free are grappling with just making sure we uh, produce everything in French and English. And then the last thing I want to comment about is about the directory. Even the, I mean, I know that there's the, the sort of agreed upon uh, sort of definitions within the research or evaluation field and some of the definitions that we don't agree w with, especially coming from Africa, from the global south. I'll just give you just one example, but I won't expand. It will be a discussion over, uh, you know, after, after this. Uh, just around the definition of household, uh, there's a whole lot of things that we don't agree with. So you miss a lot of impact if you, if you restrict it to what we call the northern uh, sort of definition of household. Just an example. <laughs> and a powerful one. Um, I think uh, I'll try to respond to the question on uh, how can you push local researchers to follow global norms. Um, I think the problem is, or the challenge is way more complicated than just the global north and the global south. Uh, might be interesting for you to know that some of the resistance we face is from researchers in the global north, uh, some of whom actually talk about transparency in their work or at conferences. 
And so I think the problem is less about uh, here's this thing that the global south is not doing. It's more about the con global conversation on how can we push research and evidence to be more scientific, more um, rigorous, and uh, better managed and reusable, uh, to go back to what Arno was saying. And I think part of that is uh, the con having an open conversation, one of the things we've started doing is including awareness sessions about research transparency, talking about what happens if evaluations don't replicate or what, uh, what confidence can you have in evaluation findings when the data used to produce those findings doesn't match. Uh, so raising awareness levels about research transparency across all the evaluations uh, we fund. So we typically have like uh, workshops for the uh, during the course of evaluations, we have workshops where we bring evaluation teams together and we use those opportunities to talk about transparency, why it's important. Uh, the idea is not fault finding, it's more to confirm uh, and validate the findings uh, using the data sets. And I think a lot of researchers understand that. There are sometimes logistical issues or minor errors which, due to which uh, results don't replicate. But I think it's the idea of um, research transparency is probably a, is, I think of it as a spectrum. You slowly get better at it. It's not like one day everybody's the expert on research transparency. Like it's not a flip of a switch. It takes thinking and practice and how do we do it better. Right, so uh, it's a journey. It's not the flip of the switch that we, I wish it was, right? Great, thanks. Uh, just quickly on this question of, of resistance, it's a larger thing, resistance to sharing, and Nita uh, hit on it, in that uh, 3IE as a, as a funder will have researchers who sign the contract go through the study and say, sure, sure, you can get my data set, but then it comes time, the study is finishing, and we want to be able to publish our, 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 our completely open access study report. Now, no, 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 wait, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sending this into a journal, and I need time. And some journals, you know, six months, and some are years. Um, and um, and that, that resistance. Now, it doesn't make them bad people, we can understand that the incentive system is what's driving this, that frankly, our impact evaluation study report, while very valuable to have out there for those uh, who don't have access to gated journals especially, but also when you want more information than you get in a journal article, our reports are very valuable, all right? But if I want to get promoted, it's not going to count. So it is that peer-reviewed journal, and, and this resistance to sharing is because our incentive system still rewards holding on, it's your data, it doesn't get reused, it's a threat to your uh, professional advancement, at least in the eyes of those who are resisting, and there's, there is evidence that, that it is affecting them. Now, this is a tension between the incentives of academics working in uh, development sector where we need quick, sound, high quality, usable data and findings in order to, to fulfill our ethical uh, responsibility to be doing work that helps poor people and improve uh, poor people's lives. Okay, so it ties back to that. Now, why do donors resist it? One, a lot of donors are wedded to an evaluation system that meets their own accountability needs. So they're not doing evaluation for learning, they're doing evaluation to make sure that nobody stole the money, that you did what you said you were going to do, and that by doing what you said you were going to do, something happened. So they will say, no, there's no need to share that evaluation because it's just confirming what happened with the program that we funded. I'm not saying that is a good answer, but that is oftentimes uh, an answer. And, um, and the, the last bit of resistance is donors oftentimes, sometimes with governments or sometimes on their own, have their own image and accountability problem. That findings that their uh, flagship programs are not effective will matter to that task manager responsible for it. So we oftentimes see negative findings being withheld because the donor does not want to have to be accountable internally uh, for those findings. So, uh, more hands. 
quickly while the hands are while while we're getting a mic to someone so that you have 30 seconds um on the need for a global uh, data d dictionary um i agree uh, to my knowledge there is none do we need one uh, yes. probably yes um but i think uh, there are two obstacles here that we need to address as a research community, and it has to do with the, f the way we're governed as a research community, how we govern ourselves. I think research is extremely siloed, and I think there are two types of silo. There are disciplinary silos, so, so sociologists don't, do not always want to work with economists, etc., and they're very jealous of their own registries and data sets and whatever. And the second silo is the national silo. So um, a lot of the research councils are funded by national governments and usually they're interested in you know, the research that affects the UK, France, India and other countries. So that's another silo. Thanks, Arnaud. Okay, um, Ashu. So this is, this is a comment. I'm hoping to get like the full three minutes maybe or could I pay for more time? Um, <laughs> So the, the transfer project, for better or worse, has found itself in a position where we are like the custodians of over a dozen, um, you know, fairly large scale evaluation data sets. Um, all those evaluations are government programs. We don't consider, we consider government to be at least part owners of those data, even if they are technically funded by DFID or, some, or someone else. Um, because they're, they're funded through an agreement, right, at the country level, and usually there's like a swap or some sort of pooled funding, and we don't consider, you know, we consider that that's really government ownership of the data, right? Um, we have a policy on data sharing and, and transparency. We've thought a lot about it. It's very controversial, but there are a couple of things I'm just going to throw out there, and again, just food for thought. So one is, what's the purpose of the data? Um, the, the purpose is, you know, to help often f fragile um, programs improve and to sort of use the data for ad the evidence for advocacy to strengthen or expand the programs. Um, so how does making data immediately public help the reason the data was collected, right? And that's the question that we, that we have to think about. So first of all, any time, you know, we make data, we make the reports publicly available, any data that's made public must reconcile their results with the official reports. And that's the first thing, okay? Because the last thing we want are multiple sort of people out there with their different takes on the data that are inconsistent. That makes government very, and the ministry, very nervous. And that's one of the main reasons that ministries are often sensitive about this, right? Um, because their programs are fragile. And the data was for their use and not for academics. The second thing is, when we say we're making data publicly available, who are we making it available to? The reality is that actually it's academics in rich countries and their students who are going to use the data. So our policy is anyone in the country that wants to use the data, an academic, gets access to the data. Why? They have skin in the game. If they publish something that goes against the results, they're living in the country. Whereas a student here at UCL has no skin in the game, right? They can say anything they want, and we bear the sort of repercussions in the country of those results. So I have a number of other things to say on this, but ultimately, um, I think, the other thing that sort of we have to think about is that there are costs to making data available. And those are very real costs. And really, ultimately, the people I know and the colleagues I work with, none of us are trying to hold data back because of our careers. And that's really not the thing that I see. What I see is it takes time. The data were, public, were made available for a reason, to help a program in a country. And making them available publicly to everyone doesn't necessarily sort of coincide with that purpose, the original purpose. Did you introduce yourself? I mean, a lot of us know you, you're quite famous, but <laughs> for the newcomers. Thank you. Another hand? And I am reminded that you're free to comment on any of the people who are, are uh, offering questions or comments, okay? It's not just a binary us to you and back again. Uh, toward the back. I would like to um, support what Ashu said, and in addition to that, wanted to talk about the data 
the, the issue on data. With regard to multinational banks, I used to work at the World Bank and Asian Development Bank. And this data, especially evaluation data, is crucial to the following year's loan or program that would be financed by the banks. So when the evaluator goes to evaluate a program in a country X, for example, I was an evaluation specialist, so I know this. And then we find that data is not satisfactory. It creates a really difficult scenario. Uh, I give an example, real example of Indonesia. I evaluated the social uh, sector program during the financial crisis. And I found out the data was really not good. So in other words, the program was not successful. It was not satisfactory. I have all the evidence. And I come up to my office and say, oh my God, look at all this data I have. What shall we do? That same week that I was doing my aid memoir and the meeting with the government, they just published a book at the office of the president praising themselves to heaven for a very successful social sector program. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do with that? <laughs> it was really difficult. I won't tell you the, the result, but I eventually quit. <laughs> <laughs> because I couldn't compromise the integrity of my data to be able to feed positive things which are not true. And I have real good data to show it. So, you know, not everybody can quit in the middle of a job. Some of us had to because of principle. But that's really an important issue. You know, when the banks get this data from evaluation, it fits into operations. <coughs> then there's the program cycle. And if there's things that are not, not exactly good, there's negotiations going on. The country and the bank and the evaluation department, which is supposed to be independent, talk together. Then there is a common agreement. That is what you call management response. And sometimes the evaluator had to compromise, but sometimes it's difficult. In the Indonesia case, it was really hard to compromise. So I had just had to quit. So this is a real issue, and it's still happening now. I mean, many had worked for the World Bank, and others probably had worked for other banks. This is true in all the banks. So that's really difficult for evaluators. Wow. Uh, thank you. You didn't introduce yourself, but, but I, I mean, that's a heroic story. And, uh, I'm Susan Tamandong. I used to be the vice president of ideas for six years. Now I'm working as an advisor to the UN Women in New York. Thank you. Okay, one more hand, and then we will again toward the back. Hello there. Um, St could you stand, please? Hello, is that on? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, my name's Louise Corty. I'm from the UK Data Service in the, in the UK. We are funded by the Economic and Social Research Council that fund an awful lot of social research in the UK to be the archive for their outputs and research. So we've been going about 50 years, um, and we do have really, I would say, quite solid protocols uh, for describing data. That could be any research that's gone through a research process. The documentation, the data, the variables, that there's quite a... Um, there's quite an interesting community around the world who have these various archives, including the data verses. We use something called the Data Documentation Initiative that has real clarification on how you describe sampling, how you provide target um, information, how you provide variables. So I think there is that out there. It's maybe not used in all communities, but it's certainly it, it's very appropriate for a range of social science studies. Um, we've got about 8,000 studies, and we have about 1,500 qualitative studies in there, including some intervention studies. So we worked on um, a DFID intervention from uh, Ghana Millennium Household um, studies about two years ago. It was really complex. It took a year, but I think the important thing is to think about tiered access. So you can start with sharing. You can try and de-identify, um, and then the much more complex stuff can be held back and put behind further gates. So the concept of having... Open research but not open access, I think it's a very important narrative. I think op open, open data is a scary concept, and I don't think uh, it should be used unless it's truly ODI open. But having these kind of tiers from open to safeguard to controlled, where the controlled is really locked down data in a safe haven, hard to get, I think that's a really good approach to thinking about things. So there is quite a lot of procedure and evidence out there. It's just connecting it all up, and certainly we don't work that closely with, with, uh, with this community unless people approach us and want to give us things. So I'm um, very interested in, in sharing procedures. Fascinating. 
Okay, back to the to the speakers to pick up on uh, the a lot um, there. We have, this is also, we have in the final 10 minutes. Um, so take it away. There was a lot said about why people don't want to share data. And let's face it, nobody wants to have negative results. Whether you're a researcher in an, a journal or whether you're, you're running a program, you don't want to hear that things didn't work. So part of what we do in our community is to try to change the dialogue around results and to explain that First of all, there are many reasons why a study may come up with bad results or they may come up or negative results or they may even come up with results that are um, not conclusive or something. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad study. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad intervention. It's telling you something about why something didn't work in that particular case. And getting people to understand that and also to not expect that what's going to come out is necessarily going to be the ultimate thumbs up, thumbs down on the whole intervention, I think is a really important precursor to being able to get things shared and make people feel comfortable being transparent about results that you know may or may not be what you would ultimately want to see. Um, I want to make it, uh, I, mean, I mean, last week I was at a conference and I attended a session where somebody says, uh, my boss loves seeing negative results. I mean, and I, I couldn't understand. And, says, and he said that because we learn from it, we, we, we don't experiment with new ways of doing things. Having said that, I, I think the, the reason why people don't want to share uh, negative results is because they see it as accountability rather than learning. And I think uh, just to stress, I think most of you know that organizations are now talking of monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And the learning part maybe is not as uh, as pronounced as the evaluation part. So I think we need to rethink the way we, we also present our data and use it the right way. Um, I think just continuing or building on what has already been said, there is a very clear publication bias as well in favor of results that are significant or interventions that worked well or whatever. So we're it goes back to what Beryl was talking about in terms of career advancement, tenure track positions, how much have you published, all of that. I mean, who wants to publish negative results? But there is so much of that learning behind those negative results. When programs, governments invest in interventions and policies for many different reasons, including uh, politics. And so I think it's important to be able to have, as evaluators, as part of our ethical responsibility, being able to talk about, OK, this goes against uh, the current. This, goes, this, this evidence actually says some, or you know, it takes courage to say in, in this post-truth world of ours that here's what doesn't work, and this is why it doesn't work. And we need to be able to speak in elevated voices in today's time rather than just agree with the ongoing narrative in terms of, OK, here's this government that doesn't want to talk about this. And so we just, I think it's even more of an ethical responsibility to raise our voices when things don't work and it's important to be heard. Yeah, I, I, I'm a researcher, but I'm also a Democrat, so which means that at the end of the day, I think that the best policy decision is not necessarily the policy that is in the conclusion of the study, but it's a version of that policy that gathers uh, a sort of political or democratic consensus. And this is not for researchers to say, well, we think that uh, everything considered, including the political costs of implementing this policy, this policy should be implemented. This is the job of policymakers. And as a Democrat, I think that I can see very many reasons why an evaluation concludes that the intervention has, for example, the positive effects on the sample, bear in mind that we work on samples, uh, has a, a positive effect and statistic a statistically significant effect on, on the, the sample. However, it shouldn't be rolled out because the political costs are greater than the supposed economic benefits of the intervention. And so, for example, it could be that stakeholders are not ready, that they will actually reject, that the people who were actually piloting the intervention were 
um, a very specific subgroup not, represent not representative of the population. So as a Democrat, I can totally accept why sometimes our, our conclusions are not ignored, but at least when everything is considered, they decide to um, implement a different policy or whatever. So I think that I'm, I'm completely, and I think we should um, tell policymakers as, as researchers that it's fine that actually if you don't want to take our advice, you may have very good reasons, but when it comes to thinking about the political costs, which is something we cannot factor in our research, you're the experts, we're not. Okay, what's the time check? Four minutes? Okay. So, great. I am going to uh, kick this last bit off, but what I'm going to do is, out of all of this discussion, what would be the one sort of dream that you would have for where we would go next, or what could be done to tackle some of these challenges? Where should 3IE be going? Um, so, for me, what came to my mind in listening to this is, there are lots of good answers out there and, and exciting ways that people are tackling these challenges, but we don't know about each other. And it is this idea of siloing and balkanization and that we talk about uh, looking for evidence within programming and within existing policies that, that reinforces this. So what came to my mind as my dream would be that we could come together and partner to focus on what is it that we need to be funding that's the connective tissue in this. What is what is the stumbling block for all of us that keeps us apart? And that this is the flip side of the coin that we're hearing about as donors are promoting more of these uh, issues on access and transparency. Again, giving on the one hand, but taking away, cooling off on funding public goods. So connective tissue is about public goods. So that's my thought and that's my dream. Um, what's my dream? I think uh, that um, I wish that the, the um, as researchers, we have to do so many things. We have to be excellent in terms of, we have to stay on top of the th literature. So we have to know the, the, the theory. We have to be good analysts. We have to be good project managers, we have to be able to uh, seek funding, we have to be good administrators, and there's only so much we can do. So I think my dream would be that we stop putting so much pressure on the researchers, but we try to decentralize and open up the research process a little bit more. Because for example, as researcher, I know how to talk and to make a point to a fellow researcher, but I'm not so good when it comes to translating. Uh, uh, a finding to a policymaker or or a beneficiary, and I'm saying this is super important. I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but uh, I think it can be done by other people. So I think we should work together, involve more people in the research process, and and perhaps alleviate a bit of the pressure that is currently on the researchers, so they can focus on whatever they're good at, which can be the theory, the analysis, and let other people who are good at translating research findings do their job, or translating into other languages, or, or whatever they're good at, and, and open, it, open, open up the research process. Thank you. I think for me, it's uh, building an awareness on why this is important, and understanding that Transparency is not something you do at the beginning of, a, of an evaluation process and at the end. So, you know, if I can pre-register my study and then make my data open, uh, I can check the box and say my research is transparent. It's also, I mean, it's, transparency is a concept that runs right through the evaluation cycle, starting with the idea of, okay, let's go out and evaluate this. Uh, and moves right through till the end, right down to sharing the results and the storytelling uh, behind it. And so I think it's about building the awareness about the fact that it's a process, that multiple people, as Arno pointed out, can play a role in that process. It's not just the PI uh, who's responsible for it. It's also, it begins with everyone involved on that team and how we can uh, emphasize greater responsibility and accountability across the board, not just, oh, here's our data and we're done, right? So building that awareness that it's, each, it's up to each one of us to think through our evaluation or research processes and figure out what can I do this time to make, it, to make my research more accessible or uh, more transparent. 
Uh, for me, it's it's about investing in the pipeline. So I, I heard quite a few people here who are working in Africa, and yet in those countries we still have, uh, you know, uh, researchers or uh, evaluators that still have problems or basic problems around accessibility. Um, I mean, I, I, I've worked, I've worked with and for development uh, partners who say we won't invest in. Uh, capital goods. We won't invest in infrastructure, but we'll invest in research or invest in environment. How do you expect the people to give you the information that you want, and when you can't provide at least infrastructure to to to, to help them to access internet at least, uh, computers or whatever to help them, you know, access the data that they need to use to do the research? Or so I think those are the basics that we, uh, I think we need to provide when we go into an area where we are working, and especially if we want to, to leave the people better off. And um, another thing is how do we depoliticize the issue of, of data and accessibility issues, and how can we share the, I mean, we realize, like um, Beryl said, that there are many people doing all these, uh, you know, good things where they act, you know, providing free access, how can we ensure that this information is freely accessible and so we can also access it, uh, you know, from different parts of Africa? Thank you. I think from this conversation, we have to say a dream has to be good internet in Africa, otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but beyond that, I, I think if I have to prioritize, I would not prioritize the making data sets publicly available for many reasons that have been mentioned here. Not that it's not important, but I think if we just think about the, the scale of the challenge and what we want to make available first, uh, I would say get, let's get the actual studies and the information in those studies out there and then let's also think about data. And maybe just one other suggestion for 3IE is uh, I think we could have a whole day at the next evidence week on this topic because one of the things that struck me is when we hear transparency and openness, we're all coming at it from various different perspectives, a conceptual framework that lays it all out for us and then leads us through those bits of the conversation I think would be really helpful and very fruitful. So thanks for thanks kicking for it off. Great. Look forward. Keep track. Come back next year. <laughs> um, next evidence week.